Stone, thanks for doing this. Great to be here. So, how's Washington changed since you first got here? Well, the restaurants are much better. <laughs> there's more culture, there's more nightlife. You know, they used to say that Washington was a town of northern charm and southern efficiency. I think John Kennedy said that. But it's really become a more cosmopolitan city. Uh, and it's changed a great deal since I lived here. You know, I like good restaurants as well as the next man. It always had nice museums. But, you know, during the 2016 primary campaign, a couple of the candidates uh, in the Republican side, and, some, and I think Bernie Sanders on the Democratic side, said, you know, six of the seven or six of the eight richest counties in America ring Washington. And I checked at it, and it's true. And it be, what it became a symbol, what it symbolized to people is that, you know, Washington's a wash in money. We're doing well, <coughs> but that the rest of the country isn't. It's, a, it's sure. sort of a symbol that how Washington's well, screwing. It's because, it's because government will never go out of business. And when government runs out of money, they can just print some more. Uh, and uh, it is an oasis in the sense that it's a, it's a, an elitist conclave where everybody, generally speaking, thinks one thing. You know, there's a, a conventional wisdom on most things. That it changes quickly, don't get me wrong, but it, it is, uh, it's very insular. Uh, the other thing here, of course, is in Washington, D.C., a lot of the people are really phony. If you want to find real people, go to Hollywood. <laughs> Now you're from upstate New York. Originally? I'm actually from. I'm actually from the. Uh, I grew up uh, on the Fairfield County, Westchester County line okay. in suburban New York, and I lived in both Connecticut as an infant, and then in New York on the New York side of the border um, when I was in high school. And uh, when did you first come to Washington? I came here in 1970 to attend George Washington University, but I really came here to work for the re-election of Richard Nixon. So I was taking courses at night and working at the committee to reelect the president by 1972. We all know how that worked out. Yes, but how come your name never surfaced in Watergate? Well, it only surfaces in a very minor sense, and that was um, they came up, uh, my boss, whose name was Bart Porter, who was a deputy to Jeb Magruder, came up with this cockamamie idea that I should go to New Hampshire with this enormous jar of coins and contribute it to Pete McCluskey's campaign for president. He was a Republican congressman, was challenging Nixon. And that I should get a receipt in the name of the Young Socialist Alliance. <laughs> that's, pretty, that's pretty benign for a well, dirty trick. And Did they you were, do it? Well, and they were going to then, I guess, give this to Bill Loeb at the Manchester Union Leader and make a story out of it. So. Uh, you know, it was enough to get me dragged in front of the grand jury uh, and questioned by the Watergate special prosecutors, but um, nothing ever came of it. Also, Bill Loeb never wrote the story, so the whole thing was superfluous. Many years later, I find, get this book by, uh, I think it's by Jack Odes, which is a compendium of memos to and from Richard Nixon. And lo and behold, there's a memo from Pat Buchanan. This is his idea. <laughs> he, he writes a memo to Haldeman saying, get some kid to go to New Hampshire. Well, I was that kid. I, I, my father wrote a book about McCloskey that about, called the McCloskey Challenge about that, <coughs> about that race. He uh, was a very interesting guy, Pete McCloskey, Marine veteran. Yeah. He beat Shirley Temple for Congress. Yeah. The uh, child actress. He, re he represented that district. It was for a long time, liberal Republican district, Silicon Valley, we call it now. He was a, he was a great critic of Israel. Yeah. Well, you know, I, there's a story about that. I went to see Pete. He was a congressman here. About uh, he went through uh, when, he's, when we, he was playing. He was with the PLO. He was yes. criticizing Israel. Yes. And John Ruslow, you remember him? Yes, of course. A bircher, a congressman. Good friend of mine. Yeah, a good friend of Pete's too. They went to South Pasadena High School together. Yes. One was the most liberal Republican in the Congress. The other was probably the most conservative. They were good yes. friends. And Ruslow came over and he said, he "said Pete." So you're going through your Vanessa Redgrave phase. He says, well, no, someone's got to keep Israel, you know, accountable. He says, what is this shit, Pete? What, what are you talking about? Uh, he says, well, you know, John, sometimes you got to show them you got balls. And Russo, who'd known Pete since high school, said, Pete, there have been four bayonet charges by the Marine Corps in this century, and you led two of them. No one doubts you have balls. 
Sometimes they wonder if you have brains. <laughs> and, the re and why I love Pete McCloskey so well, he told that story on himself to me. That's how I know it. Russolo was a, he was a great guy. He, I think he first got, came to the house in 1962. Then he lost his seat in 1964. Then he got it back in 1966. Uh, he was the most pragmatic bircher I ever knew. Yeah, yeah, he, was, he was very funny too. Yes. He was, the, I think he's the one who, remember in Sacramento, they, they, John G. Schmitz and some of these guys were <coughs> sitting around, Frank Fats, they were wearing brown suits one day. Yes. And Ruslow came up and said to Schmitz, John, I didn't know we were supposed to come in uniform. <laughs> so self-deprecating humor. Yes. A lost art. Yes. Uh, in this town. Well, you saw a little bit of it at the Al Smith dinner. What was interesting was that they both had pretty good comic material written. You're talking about Trump and Hillary? Trump, Trump and Hillary. Yeah. Uh, and then Trump kind of tips over the table by violating the tradition of keeping it light and not engaging in heavy contact conduct uh, so he launches a vicious attack on Hillary and then when it's her time to speak after her joke she responds in kind so they both uh, uh, changed the tradition of the Al Smith dinner the only piece of good news is it's impossible to look bad in white tie <laughs> um, do you still do your best dressed Oh, yes. List. Yeah, this will be the 11th year. Yeah. Uh, you notice uh, I wore my Italian tie. I see that you're working. I, at your, someday yeah. I'm going to break into that. Maybe so many people try to bribe me to get on the <laughs> list. It's unbelievable how many bribes there are, have been offered. But uh, Well, Trump's uh, no threat to make the best th dress list. No, but he has his own kind of style. You know, he wears these uh, Brioni custom-made suits. The white, the red power tie. I mean, he's the guy who gave us the red power tie. That was his thing in the 80s. Uh, what he wears works really well for him. He's broad shouldered, uh, he's tall. So, I mean, I think it, you know, he, he shouldn't look like me and I shouldn't look like him, but it works <laughs> for him. Um, you know, and the good news is that even though I think Jake Tapper has been quite biased in his reporting, he is going to stay on the best dress list for another year. Jake? So, yes. <laughs> so we have a scoop. We do. Jake's a dresser. <laughs>